The Unshackled Waves, episode 260. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. An ongoing political story the past few months has been the attempted takeover of Fred Nile's Christian Democratic Party by two members of the party's youth wing, 19-year-old Samrat Joshua Gruel, who's previously been a contributor to The Unshackled, led a motion at a state council meeting on Saturday the June the 1st to dismiss the board of the party. He was assisted by 22-year-old Joel Jamal, who is a contributor to Carnage House Productions. Samrat's motion was successful, though the party president, Ross Clifford, claimed uh, because he'd adjourned the meeting, the vote was invalid. A two-month legal dispute ensured, with a revote occurring at another state meeting on Saturday the 10th of August, uh, with a vote of no confidence in the board being overwhelmingly defeated, 80 votes to 12. It was an extremely bold move for two years to try and overthrow Fred Nile, who founded the first incarnation of the Christian Democrats in 1977 and was first elected to the New South Wales Parliament in 1981. The party failed to retain a seat in the New South Wales Parliament for the first time in its history in the March 2019 state election, with the minor party field becoming particularly crowded. Certainly the Christian Democrats needed to regroup and explore the best way to go forward. But was such an extreme course of action, especially from members so young and inexperienced the best way to do it. Well, Samrat and Joel are my guests today where I will ask them to reflect on their chosen course of action and what their political plans are for the future. Samrat and Joel, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Now, there's been a lot of requests for for you two to, to be on this show, given that all of the news that you two were making uh, with your motion with the, the Christian Democratic Party. Now, obviously, you're motivated because you believed in the party and its uh, philosophy. So to start off the show, I just want to get an answer from you about uh, why you decided to, to join the party and why, well, given that there's, there's so many options, why it was the party for you. It was about late 2016, I was moved back to Australia looking for a political party. And I was sifting around, and at that time, I don't believe Australian Conservatives were around. One Nation was up in Queensland, and all the other minor parties were um, just starting up. Um, and so I was like, I need uh, a good moral party to join. And the only one around New South Wales was the Christian Democrats. And so that's initially why I joined them. And... Um, as I got more involved and, more, and did more volunteering for them, you know, it just became clear that this is the party I wanted to kind of commit to, and that's what I did. And looking around now, um, there's obviously a lot more choice of people going to politics. So back then, it was the only kind of um, solid uh, conservative party around. Yeah, and I guess with me, I um, when did I join? I joined the um, the youth movement of the. Um, the Christian Democrat Party early uh, this year. It was uh, not long after I'd met Samrat. Um, we ran into each other because he was um, involved with the Australian Conservatives, some, some of the Conser Australian Conservatives members who recommended me to meet him. And, um, you know, we crossed paths and, um, and we just got on like a house on a fire. And, uh, you know, he told me about some of the things um, that the CDP sort of stood for and what he's trying to do in the in the young CDP to sort of, you know, invigorate it. And uh, yeah, it really excited me, um, especially because they were very proud Christians. Um, you know, because I was also, of course, you can be a member of two parties at once, um, being the Australian Conservatives and the Christian Democrat Party. And the Australian Conservatives, they were somewhat Christian. Um, they recognised that they their values were rooted in Christian values, but they weren't overtly Christian. And if they did brand themselves that way, it wouldn't make them unique because there was already a party with that mandate. Um, so it was it was refreshing to be a part of both. Now, Samra, you're a candidate for the Christian Democrats uh, at the New South Wales state election for Mount Druitt, uh, where you yep. live, and we had you on the Unshackled's election night live stream that evening you got a solid 
uh, vote there. Uh, so you, yep. I remember you were very busy during the, the campaign and obviously uh, campaign management in any political party is, is stressful, but is that when your concerns about how the party was being managed began to develop? Oh, absolutely. Um, when I was running for Mount Druitt, the way I kind of saw the campaign being taken over by one particular candidate in the upper house, it raised lots of red lights to me about how they might be doing the same with the broader party in general and you're know, trying to push for their own agenda as opposed to looking out for the party as a whole. Um, and when I started to dig a bit deeper into why there's certain issues of the party, it just pointed back to a few people who are um, you know, serving their own agendas as opposed to doing what's best in membership. And that's what ticked me off around the end of the state campaign. Um, then we had the federal campaign. And the exact same thing happened again where the same issues popped back up. And it was, um, you know, the same couple of people running the show and just ignoring um, the rest of the membership. In a state campaign, well, the only way for most of the time for, for minor parties to win is to win a seat in the upper house. And the New South Wales Legislative Council, it only has a quota of 4.3%. Uh, so, of course, in a New South Wales state election, all the... the promotion is going to be of the upper house candidate and the, the lower house uh, candidate is designed to be able to bump up the, the upper house votes. Though uh, I did notice that the Christian Democrats, they had less lower house uh, candidates than previously, but it was a very crowded minor party field in that legislative council election at the, the March poll. Australian Conservatives, uh, they ran in their first New South Wales election. They no longer exist now, but there was also uh, the Liberal Democrats. Obviously, the Shooters and Fishers were there, but also One Nation uh, with uh, Mark Latham at the, as the lead candidate, who was a big draw card and who hadn't mm. uh, run a, a real campaign in New South Wales for, for many years. Uh, they managed mm. to get uh, two quotas. So could you really explain the, the defeat on the internal party management alone? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I believe around the year 2000, the CDP got 10% of the state vote, um, something like that. Um, and that's when Fred should run for that house, but he didn't do it then. And so the, the success of other minor parties like the Australian Conservatives, like One Nation, is due to the CDP's internal management. If the CDP took that 10% of the vote they got a couple of decades back, and just capitalized on that and built the party up, built the youth movement up and built the brand up, then there'd be no space for Mark Latham to come along and swipe up four seats. There'd be no space for um, the OzCon brand to even appear in New South Wales. And that's all coming back down to poor management and people just serving their own agenda as opposed to the, the agenda of the party. If you think about it, you know, when you look at the party's vote after that point, it's just been around a stable 3%, you know, drops a little bit under, goes a little above that. And that's enough to elect just one person. Um, and that's the kind of uh, agenda I've seen the party following is that we're a party of one or maybe two people and don't go beyond that because it's not what we're about. We're just about that one or two people. And that's why other parties did so well in New South Wales. Unlike Sam, I can actually speak towards both parties, the Australian Conservatives I was a member of and... Um, the Christian Democrat Party, but starting with the Christian Democrat Party, I was I remember talking to Samra uh, during the time of his um, when he was he was going, he, he was trying he was running to, for a seat in Mount Druitt, and he was telling me about how um, he gets a certain amount of money to run his campaign. He's got a, he's on a budget, uh, and how you know he does he, he just completely didn't want to do stuff like you know letterboxing. He 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 was using unconventional methods to. Um, you know, get votes, and and that's what I th what I thought you should be doing, um, but that's not what the rest of the party was doing. And you know, look at the look at the votes that they ended up um, getting. Um, you know, Paul Green he needed five thousand votes, didn't get it, um, got thrashed in the election, and the Australian Conservatives did no better. I mean, they they had their hands tied, especially from the leadership, um, of course, being Corey Bernardi. Um, the um i've got a lot to say on that if we want to delve into it tim but um yeah look it, it, similarly it was a failure of leadership there where a lot of the most brilliant members weren't able to do their best work yes i interviewed ricardo uh, bossi on the the failure of the australian conservatives not just in the the federal election but also in the new south wales 
uh, state mm. election. And yeah, obviously, uh, Cory Bernardi has taken the Australian Conservatives name and, and deregistered, but I know that they're Ricardo Bossi and uh, Sophie York are, are staying behind to, to build uh, something new. But yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll stick with the, the Christian uh, Democrats for now. Both of you are very young and inexperienced in politics. I mean, you hadn't been in the party very long. There are frustrations and setbacks in any political career. I was a member of the political party for a, for a number of years, so I've experienced this. So my advice to you would have been if you were feeling that things weren't being managed right is to probably just suck it up for the time being and play the longer game if if you're unhappy yeah well you know that's the advice lots of people have been giving and i asked them well how did that work for you um and the results are always dismal you know if you've got the a whole bunch of right-wing factions young liberals playing the long game um and they're not having much success there and when you look at look at the long game, you know you think, okay, you know maybe in five years we can work you know, our way up and then change the party. Maybe in ten years, maybe when we're forty or fifty, we can finally bring the party from the brink of death. But the issue is that while we all play the long game, you know the the left wing parties, the you know the um, the socialist groups, the Muslim groups, they're all playing the short game. They're coming in and making huge gains in you know smallest amounts of time. So while we're here trying to plot for long haul, they're here taking over space, and that's going to make it even harder in the long run to, to take that space back. Joel? Yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah, look, it's not quick enough. It's not quick enough. Um, I'm sitting on a recording where I talked to the CDP board on the weekend, actually, and um, tell them about you know what happened in my country and um, with Lebanon and Syria and how the countries essentially got ruined and it was because of that same talk oh, don't worry try next time try next time it'll be better next time you know it's like no this is life and death we have there are significant forces uh, and I, I cite Ricardo Bosi because he's, he's outlined them as the five um, forces fighting against um, Western civilization, Christian values and and all of that. And you need to realize the urgency. You, you, we, we are on the clock. There are, you know, big tech is shutting people down. There's over two and a half million subscribers of YouTubers that have contacted me and said they're being silenced. I mean, Google's been manipulating elections in America 2.6 million votes to 10 million votes. We need to we need to act very quickly and uncon and we need to act unconventionally. We need to change our tactic tactics because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So that's what I, that's pretty much what we wanted to do. And we weren't argue, we weren't out saying that we knew what what to do was best. That was no that was we weren't under any illusions. We what we were requesting was for more support or more um, guidance and um, what do you call it, Sam, right? pastoral leadership, sort of to be stewarded, to have them guide us, to, for there to be that intergenerational uh, leadership where you, they sort of take you under their wing and they show you um, the way, but for also there to be that transition as well, whereas we'd had Fred as our leader for 40 years with no transition. That's not healthy. And it, it hasn't been, there's, there hasn't been a transition full stop. Well, that's because it's always been Christian Democratic Party, Fred Nile group, because in the 70s and 80s, when well, Australia was going, that's when Australia's cultural revolution happened. Fred Nile was at the, the front line fighting it. During that time, he was uh, the most well-known uh, opponent of the uh, permissive society and uh, all of the uh, vice that, that, that was happening, especially in, in Sydney at the time. So uh, I, I don't think it's fair to say that the Christian Democrats have sort of lost sight of the, the battle because they were the front line. It's just that new people have come along throughout the years, obviously Pauline Hanson in the 90s about uh, uh, immigration and, and multiculturalism. Uh, but what you just described there, that's, that's just a challenge with because it's always been a, a cult of personality around Fred. And I mean, he still does do a, a pretty good job, even though he is uh, quite old now and he's been very 
Uh, pra he's very pragmatic in Parliament. He's not like some of these senators we've seen in Canberra who threatened to blow the whole place up. I think that everyone knew that, well, he's in his 80s now. He's, his time... 85. His ti yeah, his, ti his time was coming. You well, that's not in dispute, if you, don't, if you don't mind me saying. That's not in dispute, uh, if you don't mind me saying, Tim. The, the problem is... Uh, as someone had said in the past, Fred has been very comfortable in his position, only earning, you know, getting about 3% every, you know, few elections just to get into Parliament, get him into Parliament. So this is very much Fred's Christian Democrat Party, whereas it hasn't, he hasn't really taken the extra leaps in the past to actually put himself out there and actually grow the party so that it becomes not just the Fred Nile party, but a very strong Christian party. Because now what the prospect we're looking at is we're looking at a depleted membership, we're looking at uh, a lack of leaders, and that is ultimately um, the why there's such a big market for leadership books right now, including Ricardo Bosi's one, because there is a lack of leadership, and we, you know we, the leaders of um, you know the t a time past have not done an effective job of training up young leaders. And I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about 30 year olds, I'm talking about 40 year olds and 50 year olds, not 85 year olds. That's a fair criticism, but many people would argue that uh, the motion you and Sam Rutt tried was out of proportion to those concerns. I just want to, before we get to that, just uh, I read your list of grievances with the party. Uh, you, you spoke in your speech, I know, about the battle that Western civilization faces, but your list of grievances, they seem to me like they were made up of semantical arguments that the party rules and procedures weren't properly followed in, in several cases. And the basis for your claim it, for the party being poorly managed is, is based on a lot of technicalities, which I don't think you could really prove. Well, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the actual grievances weren't meant for the board themselves. It wasn't like, hey board, hey Fred, hey Ross, these are our issues. Those grievances are meant for the members to understood the technicalities and the technical implications of the leadership issues. And if we did have a, a list of grievances of what the issues actually were, um, that would err on the side of, of very defamatory. Um, you know, it's those grievances are the byproduct of a certain culture within the leadership. If you don't mind me saying, Tim, um, it was twofold. The list was originally private, and I, I don't know how it's gotten out, but um, essentially when I took that list and I gave a 10-minute speech to the board, it was a private speech for 10 minutes. They had a two-hour meeting and they discussed these issues, and then they passed a motion to have my list um, investigated, essentially. And that was what the interim board, origi we, we originally planned was that we'd investigate the matters, we'd bring it towards them and they, they could address it properly, which they've done. So we consider that a success. The other part of this, and this is why we've been raising this in June following the election, was that it's not about, per it's not about personality, it's about performance. And unfortunately, on the weekend, we had a comprehensive um, presentation from Dr. Con Cafetaris. He gave a very good speech and he gave another five minute uh, rebuttal and he explained it's not about it's not about personality, it's about performance. You guys, you need to change the executive. We have lost over a quarter million dollars in funding since the last election, uh, since the, the previous election in 2015. And this is, this is the problem. It, the reason why Bill Shorten isn't the leader of the Labor Party is because he lost an election. When you have an executive that doesn't meet his marks, he gets the sack. And so why should it be any different? And I think the revelation Samra and I saw on the weekend and maybe some rats known this for a while, is that it's run like a church. It's not run like a political party. Political parties need votes. They need seats to make a change. Oh, well, churches need members and, and donations. So the two are somewhat similar, but yes, you need to convince a whole lot of people who don't attend church on a Sunday to, to vote for you every three or four years. Now, I want to go back to, to that meeting on Saturday, uh, June the, the 1st. Now, obviously, to get this motion up, which you thought that you did successfully, it would have required a lot of uh, planning. Did you have many high-ranking members or party elders on your side? And 
although, as we've established, the party is facing problems, and I've established you're both very young, did all the experience that the party has accumulated over the years need to be thrown out and you two and the, the people around you needed to take charge? There were many um, high-ranking party uh, office bearers who were in support of us on our side. There were many members and branches who were on our side. And the goal wasn't to just wipe out leadership and be like, you know, all of them are out. The goal was to clean the board up and then take a, a, a look while they're not on the board, because when they're on the board, they try to halt investigations and subvert votes. So the idea is to get the board off their, their high horse and off their chairs and then look at each of them individually and say, okay, which one of you contributed to the culture that's led to the decline of the party? Which of you authorized hundreds of thousands of dollars of illegal transactions? Which of you are responsible for the for the party being in its current state? And upon that, deciding, okay, which should return to the board because they've done a good job and which shouldn't be on the board? And it wasn't, you know, people always point at the the fact that Fred was on the board, that this is a move to kind of oust Fred. No, you know, that's removing Fred from the board. He's still in parliament. He's still a parliamentarian for the party. No major party has parliamentarians on their executives. It's it's not a thing. So, you know, it's just the party um, conforming to what is standard political procedure. And um, we didn't intend at all to kind of take charge and take lead of the party and, you know, bring into the 22nd or 25th century, whatever. Um, all we intended to do was to push for change and push for the members to actually be able to have a dialogue about the issues and then vote on what they wanted the new direction to be. And then we're out of that. It was, we see it as an inflection point. We needed to make a correction. Um, there were allegations at the time of um, corruption and uh, mismanagement of the party, and we wanted to investigate it further. And um, they just were ineffective as a board. And um, we decided to take action and um, let them put them on notice. And if anything, I think they appreciate that because it actually invigorated a lot of their members. Like, I mean, that we had a meeting with 100 people on the weekend and Fred himself said he hasn't seen that for a long time, especially with all the cameras after the June 1st meeting. Now, after your motion was successful at that June 1st meeting, why did you decide to go to the mainstream media and and brag about uh, what you what you'd done and and turn what should be an internal party dispute into a media spectacle? I remember when your Facebook page Sam Wright was active, you were sort of being quite you were doing a victory lap on it, making making all of these salacious uh, posts. Was was that the wise yeah. thing to do? In, it was in retrospect to every other move um, in the party to reform it. So I look back at the past 20 years and every time someone has tried to, to raise the very issues I've raised, and in 2011, the party had a massive split where thousands of members exodus out into the Australian Christians because of the exact same issues I raised. When I look at that and I say, okay, why didn't it work? It was because the executive knew that if these members raise issues, it would be internal and we can just ignore it and then they'll leave. Um, and, you know, who cares? We don't have to deal with that. But the moment it becomes a public issue, the moment members of the public know that taxpayer money, because political parties receive taxpayer money, that means regardless of if you're a member or not, if you're a Green supporter, some of your tax is going to fund the CDP. The issue was that, you know, taxpayer money is being used in a political party that's breaking laws. And when you make that a public issue, they can't just shut it down. They can't just ignore the, the debate and, and close down the forum. They have to address it, and they did address it. And Fred had a, um, a media conference uh, the Monday after the state council um, where he tried to address the issues, and that was the point. It's like what Trump does. You know, he, he isn't a naturally boastful person. He just puts that facade on so that the attention comes and people actually look at the issues. And that, you know, that's why I did. I'm not, personally, I'm not all out there and up my ego and stuff, but that's what needed to happen for the media to kind of pick up on it and for people's eyes to turn on the CDP and be like, oh, what's going on there? And that's why I did um, do what I did. It worked. It worked. I mean, they didn't want to cover this weekend because it wasn't a young versus old. It was reconciliatory, you know? And I think that I don't regret the fact that we went and uh, made the moves that we did. Perhaps we could have been a bit more 
less bombastic, but at the same time, that's not what gets Channel 9 and Channel 10 and Sydney Morning Herald, Daily Telegraph, everyone looking at this. They just don't care. They want to see some punches thrown. And as a result, yes, it was it was very stressful for all parties. But I think um, it's it was a net benefit for everyone, even if um, Samrat and I are, are not still interested in the party. Um, but um, I think I think that it was I think that it was yeah well, look it was interesting it was very interesting how it played out and I don't think anyone could have called it the way it did. Another media appearance that the pair of you made was on SBS's uh, The Feed. They interviewed all the different <laughs> uh, parties uh, to the Christian Democrat dispute, uh, spoke with Fred Nile and, uh, and a few other, including a, a, a journalist who'd, who'd followed the party. And yes. uh, they came to your house, uh, Samrat, uh, in Mount Druid, and, yeah. and filmed you at home doing various things. And then uh, you showed them uh, what uh, literature... Uh, you read and you held up a copy of Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto and then a copy of uh, Adolf Hitler's <laughs> Mein Kampf yeah. and SBS they decided when they, they posted the story on social media they would have you holding the copy of, of Mein Kampf as the, the featured image. Now yeah. Like, it's not a crime to read Mein Kampf in Australia, and reading it uh, doesn't make you a Nazi, but you volunteered that information. Was that really the wisest thing to SBS, a multicultural broadcaster, to just hold that up so they can make it so that, uh, look, this is the book that I'm most proud to read? Well, I think, you know... Um... It comes back down to what is the etiquette of someone who's involved in politics, right? When people look at you know, other people involved in politics, all they see are stuck-up people who are too up themselves in PC culture and, oh, don't make that joke, oh, don't do that because we're all posh here and we're all in suits and ties and fancy and all all high and mighty. Um, you know, to an extent, uh, there was lots of trolling in that SBS uh, feed video, but the intention of it all was to show people that, you know, hey, yeah, I'm involved in politics. Hey, I'm you know, doing this, um, you know, taking political action in the party, but I'm not like those politicians who are too scared to, you know, reveal the fact that they have read a particular book or the other. And it's not, it's not about the books. It's about showing people that politics shouldn't be this kind of cultural minefield of don't touch that, don't touch that, don't touch that. Because it creates a separation from politicians and the people, right? It makes politicians almost otherworldly in their conduct, in their tastes, and what they do, and how they hold themselves from everyone else. Yes, there should be a certain separation between how politicians hold themselves versus how the voters hold themselves. But if you, you, know, you make that separation as large as the void between hell and heaven, it makes voters feel alien to everyone involved in politics. And it makes them ignore politics, it makes them feel like, oh, politics is, is too, you know, uh, for me. And, and by doing that, I think the barrier, you know, I like to think the barrier closed a little bit. And yes, it was extreme, but it shows people that, you know, people involved in politics aren't completely deprived of humor or completely deprived of having interests in things that are on the extreme left or extreme right. It's not some uh, angelic realm of demons with angel masks who, you know, never reveal that they like odd stuff and they like to troll a bit, you know, it's, that's why I like to think of it. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, but maybe for someone so, so young as you as being first introduced to a, a national audience, maybe that's just not something you should have volunteered right away. But how did you manage to get a copy of that? Did you have to buy it like from a CD shop with a brown paper bag? I think I got the Communist Manifesto from high school when we were doing um, the Russian Revolution. That's where I got a copy of that. And I got the English translation of Mein Kampf off eBay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that was delivered to your actual name? Yeah. Name, okay. address, all there. Wasn't too hard to get. And Joel, did you know that Sam Rat had volunteered that literature? What did you, what did you make of it? I found out the same time everyone else did. And uh, I was just shocked because, I mean, you know what it's like, Tim. You see the the insults that get thrown at people on the right that where there's not a shred of evidence that 
they're Nazis. And then the next minute, Na- um, Sam Rat's like, look, I read the, com- the Communist Manifesto and Mein Kampf. It's like, <laughs> you are asking for it, son. <laughs> anyway. Now, obviously, you weren't just speaking to the general public. You were, you were also speaking to a lot of Christian Democrats supporters who were maybe unsure about uh, where, where they stood in the dispute. And I remember on your page uh, the next day, Sam Rat, uh, you addressed members who weren't quite thrilled at uh, sort of how you presented yourself on the feed. All right, so that, that address wasn't to members per se, because um, a large majority of members don't have Facebook. Uh, they were over the particular age of users um, that generally do engage that. Um, the, the addressment was to two people specifically who weren't even uh, our supporters. They were uh, on the opposite side who just made an accusation here and there. And that's what the addressment was to. It wasn't to anyone who supported us. People who supported us, they looked at it, they laughed, they you know, brushed it off. I think um, it was either the Sydney Morning Herald or the Daily Telegraph did a small follow-up piece on their website where they mentioned um, the book and they put it on their social media. And no one, no one cared. No one took a bite. It was just like, oh, you know, so what? It's, it's just a book. Now, getting back to the serious matters, uh, Ross Clifford, who is the state Christian Democrat president, and Fred Nile, they responded that your motion was invalid because Ross Clifford, he adjourned the meeting. So this set off a, a legal dispute, which has lasted until now. A, a fresh uh, state council meeting was... Uh, called uh, to conduct a, a revote on Saturday, the the tenth of August. So, does this mean that your motion, which you thought uh, had legal standing, it was found in the end to be invalid? No, no, no. That's not what happened. So, in essence, what occurred? Now, you use a later example of of to try to kind of explain the whole mystery around the motion and the legality of it. So, before the state council um, in August. Uh, the party agent, Philip Gerber, emails were sent back and forth between him, the state director, the board, and um, former party agents and secretaries. And within the span of a day or two, he had gone from the conclusion that the board was invalidly elected last year and that he was going to dissolve it. And he flipped and the next hour he said, oh, I completely support the board. The next hour he was like, oh, you know, maybe um, the motions to even sack the board are completely invalid. And this state council shouldn't have voted it at all. And then he flipped against it. Oh, maybe I'll allow it because it does seem a bit legal. And he kept flipping back and forth. And that's what happened with the motion, is that the lawyers came back and said it's a completely bad motion. But the party executive went, you know, all schizophrenic on me. On one hand, it's legal. The other hand, it's legal. So the way the party functions is if the law suits what the party wants, that's the law that applies. If it doesn't suit it, then just ignore it. And so that's what happened. And, and the only way to fight that is if you have an extra 500k lying around to take it to Supreme Court. And unfortunately, um, we didn't have that, so we couldn't you know, challenge it. You as a member can't do much because the barriers set forth are so tremendously expensive that you know, it just it makes people give up and be like, there's nothing more I can do. Yeah, I think so. pretty much hit the nail on the head. The legal advice we were given from the party agent before the event uh, was spot on. And then he flipped, and then he flipped again, and then he did a double flip. And it was incredibly confusing. And if it was confusing for us, you can imagine what it was like for the people that were really hoping something would come from this. And um, in essence, we thought we thought we, we had dot, dotted our eyes and crossed our T's. But no, it, it seemed like inconclusive. They somehow managed to brush it off and say that they took our motion on notice and that made it okay. That's what they that's what the official narrative is. That's what the official notes that they took on the day were. That the our motion my motion that I put forward of no confidence would be taken on notice. And that would be voted on at a later date, which was this last weekend on the 10th of August. Um, so it took them two months to get round to that. But in terms of the gymnastics that were done for them to do that, amazing. They just don't want to, uh, they just can't deal with the fact that, you know, Samrat had, didn't like the um, 
was point. They didn't like the fact that someone was pointing out the in inequities, both of management and of performance. And um, we really saw that on the weekend when they when they stacked the membership with people whose minds that were already made up, and they didn't listen to a thing we said. Well, maybe you should have stacked back, or should have been stacks on the mill, as I call There's, that. Well, those people are out of the party now, unfortunately. They saw the light before us. Something that you've attempted, it's, it's never occurred before in an Australian political party that a bunch of young whippersnappers have been able to knock off the entire old guard. And so my personal prediction is that this would happen. There'd be, there'd be some sort of revote and uh, things would, would return to somewhat normality. Going to my next point, it's all very easy to point out uh, what's going wrong in a political party. You, you talked about some of it, the fact that it is an older membership and they tend to or well, just do campaigning the old fashioned way. You mentioned letterboxing, still sending out things through through snail mail with everything these days. It's, it's online with, with targeting of people on social media. But you mentioned Australian Conservatives my newsfeed was polluted by content from the Australian Conservatives and I got emails from them all the time. So they were doing things the, the modern way, but obviously it didn't help, help them. So go into a bit of detail about what your vision would be to, to change the party and most importantly, why it would work because that's, people have to believe that you've got the answer. Firstly, uh, you know, I'll tell you, how you can fix it up. It's, it's the one issue party and it shouldn't be. Now I'll tell you why, because when people go out to vote and they say, okay, what party am I going to vote for? They're not thinking about, oh, okay, maybe I'll vote for this party because it's for same-sex marriage or against same-sex marriage. Maybe I'll vote for this party because of the abortion bill stuff. They're thinking about, I'm going to vote for this party because I want my taxes cut. Or I'm going to vote for this party because they're going to, they're going to build a metro here or because this party has good policies that are going to affect my business, or because this party is going to address the broken Centrelink system. And that's how you fix the party up. You make it a party that addresses issues people care about, in addition to the Christian ones. And you add a Christian spin to other issues. And that's how you do it. It's as simple as that. It's You just give people what they need and what they're looking for. If they're looking for a party that addresses things close to home, they're going to vote for your party. They're not going to vote for you just because you say, oh, I'm going to slash immigration to like zero percent. They don't care about that. They care about tangible things before they go, they're going to you know, look at the immigration rates and look at um, same-sex marriage and, and, and abortion. And that's, that's, that's just how you do it. You just expand the issues. The second thing to do is to stop using um, kind of a scary culture and scary words and, and being ultra negative all the time. And one of the issues with the right-wing parties is all the language they use is always very pessimistic about the future, right? They're always like, oh, this is happening, and that's going to destroy Australia. This is happening, that's going to destroy Australia. This is going to destroy us. This is going to destroy us. And when people go to vote or they watch your ads, they go on your website, they don't want to hear that this is a negative future that's going to, that's going to occur for Australia. They want to hear what are you going to do about it and what's the positive future going to look like. They want positive language. And when the party got um, McCrindle that analytics survey company to do um, a bunch of research for us. They came back saying that. They came back saying, your party is too negative. You need to be positive. Talk about same sex marriage, talk about abortion, but talk about the positives of what you're gonna do. Instead of saying we're against same sex marriage, we're against abortion. You say we're pro traditional marriage, we're pro life. And that's, that's how you do it, just be more positive. I don't agree with that switch because we see time and time again that negative campaigning works. I mean, that's how Scott Morrison won the federal election, not because he had a comprehensive manifesto for the next term, but because he was able to scare the voters senseless about the, the taxes and danger to the economy that uh, Bill Shorten posed. So negativity does work. I mean, in some cases it does work, right? There's there's circumstances in which it can work if you're a large party. If you're a giant party powerhouse and people are conditioned into voting for you election after election after election, when you use negative language and scare tactics, you're only swinging about a few percents of a vote, right? You're, you're reaching the very, very niche people that are swing voters, right? And that's why minor parties get in 
on one or two percent because they're targeting with their scare tactics and activity that very marginal vote. So when Scott Morrison's talking about Bill Shorten's going to you know tax this, tax that, communist this, communist that, um, he's targeting a small fraction of the swing votes that will get him back in, and that's what he did. It's not it's not going to change the minds of people who always vote Liberal or people who always vote Labour. It's it's targeting the marginal uh, the marginal vote. Let's reconcile what we've got there. I certainly think that the Australia, the reason why I had, I didn't like to get involved with the Christian Democrats for so long until I met Samra was because I did genuinely view them as a negative party in the way not a, not just the way that they the language but you know we try to emulate as Christians Jesus and I didn't feel like they were bringing bringing the best parts of Christianity out I didn't I didn't see it that way and if that's their Christianity so be it but it wasn't how I sort of saw it even the way that you know Israel Israel Falau sort of talks about uh, same sex marriage he said it in the context of i want the best for you people and that's why i'm praying that you you guys come to jesus you get to know him and you change your ways it was it was from a place of love but i don't feel i never got that message when they said when they'd say it that way and it would have been great if the messaging was different now with regards to scott morrison i do think he in terms of when he was attacking policies of the other side, yes, he was negative. Yes, there was there was there were some fake news things that came out, and uh, you know it worked. And that's the thing; everyone knows that people on the right generally are more sensitive to fear and all that, and that's that what works. And I mean, that's how a lot of people have dissected the American election as well, and there's some truth to that. But with regards to Scott Morrison, he also had a very positive message. He had a he has a round face, he, he, a big smile. He, he utilized social media incredibly well and he'd, he'd keep your people in the loop about what he's doing and you know the whole campaign about the we're back in black you know uh, we're, 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 we're on target to, to be in it you know and none of that none of that who the hell knows if he's telling the truth or not you know but he looks positive whereas with labor they were overwhelmingly more um, negative and I don't think that helped them I think that Bill Shorten didn't come across as a very positive guy and there's nothing to look forward to yeah, that was the other thing why, why Scott Morrison won, because he comes across as the, the daggy dad uh, relatable. Yeah. And yeah, their social media strategy was was spot on. But you mentioned the, yeah. the Israel uh, Falau issue. And yeah, the, the, po the Instagram post that got him sacked, it was very fire and brimstone. And obviously, Fred Nile has been quite vocal against uh, sin uh, th throughout, his, throughout his years, but I'm finding, especially with online, that you know to get people's attention, you need to show them that something is not right. Uh, if you yeah. get get people to sign, sign a petition that we need more strawberry ice cream, uh, that's not going to get many signatures. But if you have a petition that uh, stop uh, putting toxins in ice cream that's making us sick, you, you might get a few more signatures. That's just an example I made yeah. up. It's not true. Absolutely. No, no, I, I agree. I agree with that technique of doing it. And I, I don't like strawberry ice cream. Uh, <laughs> no, no, look, I, I certainly think that um, there are times it's needed. But at the end of the day, especially anyone that's looking at the US election right now, I would say the standout people in the Democrat Party, the people that, you know, you don't have to know a thing about it, but they're the people relaying a positive message. They're not the ones always attacking Trump every step of the way. There are times when you hear people talk about a real positive message, like, yeah, you know, I could sign up to that. And the person's not bagging Trump as much. Like, they all bag Trump, of course, they have to. But at the same time, there are some, like Andrew Yang, who genuinely demonstrate the ability to wrestle with the ideas. I'd never vote for him, but it's very genuine. It's 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 non politician like and I think that's admirable and I think that's what our party needed to do as well. It just seemed like they weren't genuinely wrestling with the ideas. They they would never go out and in the street and have a long form discussion with a democratic socialist, for example. Now as we already established your Revote on the motion was unsuccessful. It was defeated overwhelmingly, eighty votes to twelve. You said that the the meeting was was stacked. Well, that was your interpretation of it. And Joel, in your your pitch to the the members present, basically you said that this is my last stand. That if we're not listened to, then that's pretty much it for us. <laughs> almost sounds like I was spitting the dummy. I was. I was. I, uh, you could probably say I was spitting the dummy. Let me tell you why. A range of things had happened by that point. 
I wasn't originally going to get up and speak in front of the members, and I'm going to I'm going to release a video soon about that. But um, essentially, they'd voted. The members had voted so that Samrat couldn't speak in that meeting. They had confiscated Dr. Khan's coloured material so that he could give his presentation on the analytics of how the party's going. Just facts, nothing but the facts. They didn't let him use the provided projector. They dragged a news reporter from Eternity News out by the, with the security. And then and they basically made it, uh, their entire pitch. They didn't wrestle with the ideas put forward. And it was all emotional. It was, it was basically the left. And then I got up there and I pretty much told them who I was, why we were doing what we were doing. We had nothing against the, the party, the, um, the president. We acknowledged the great work they were doing. But the problem was that they haven't learned the lessons of history. And I told them about what happened in my in my country of Lebanon. And I told them exactly how God is on your side. But the problem is you need to learn the lessons of history. This is like this. Is, it's about life and death at times. And you need to make the changes possible. And then I told them, why didn't you listen to Dr. Why don't you listen to Dr. Khan when he gives you the facts? And he says you need a dramatic change of course. Why didn't you? Why did you vote for Samrat to not speak? And you're wondering why the youth are leaving the party. And I finished on the point of saying, "Give me a reason to stay, because there are other parties with comprehensive manifestos that are very attractive. Why the hell should I stay?" Essentially, and uh, and I, I left it at that. I only had three minutes to work with, but um, that's essentially what I said. Uh, Samra, you've always got a, a a lot to say. It's not often that you're gagged. <laughs> yeah, it was. When you look at the votes, that was the closest vote of the day. Was whether or not to silence me. Um, I think it was fifty to forty or fifty to thirty-ish, and it was that was the last straw for me. It was it was that the membership had become so delusional, or the ones that attended, I, I would say, had become so delusional that they just didn't want to hear the issues. Um, and the reason why the end vote was 80 to 12 was when 2011 happened, almost three to 4,000 members left and joined the Australian Christians. When the October convention happened last year, you had almost 50 members leave then who had voted uh, for the motion then. And then when the June convention happened, you had 30 members who attended that state council leave after that because they just saw the board um, just ignoring it, all the issues and just turning a blind eye to everything. And then the end result was we had 12 members that stayed and 80, ones, uh, 80 members that were just brought on to subvert the vote. Squash the rebellion. And squash the rebellion, vote to, to disallow all people to speak and, and just quench all opposition. It was just the most undemocratic thing I have ever seen when, when the mob uses their power to destroy democracy. At least from the right, anyway. Now, at a young age, you've both had a crash course in political brutality. So what are your plans now? Obviously, you've got your whole lives ahead of you. I think we've had a good run, Sam, right? I think we should retire. No, I, th <laughs> I think, look, I personally have a lot of plans. I mean, I, I do work a full-time job. I have a lovely partner and I have a lovely family. So, I mean, this is in no way means the end. There's a lot of political battles going on right now, and I can elaborate on those if you want, including with university campus, the mandatory sexual consent stuff, censorship of Australian YouTubers, and um, there's a whole bunch of fights that need to be fought, and uh, you know, new parties are being formed. But it's I'm, I'm still very busy. It'll be nice to have a, a break from the CDP stuff because it was certainly more destructive rather than constructive. And yeah, but I'm I'm I'm. Uh, I'm glad that we've sort of tied the knot on this one. It's the end of a direct party involvement for me, so I don't think I'm ever going to go back into a single political party and, and be a member and work my ass off for them. But it's certainly not the end of my involvement in politics. And I was talking to someone last night who was, who was you know, mentioning that this is, is kind of a high point in my life and you know, there's, there's no way I can kind of top um, what we've done the last few months. And there's a lot more coming. And next year, you can expect a lot more action from myself, but it won't be in direct party involvement. It will be more across the lines and, and less partisan to one group. Now, given the extreme uh, course of action you two decided to attempt, 
do you see that with your future political ambitions that people might view the pair of you as loose cannons and and somewhat untrustworthy like how do they know that you're not going to suddenly we've, turn <laughs> and and overthrow we've, them we've seen loose cannons in the cdp um and i've frequently looked at what i've done and what these loose cannons do and anyone who's smart in politics will know that we're not loose cannons and there's a very big difference between loose cannons and people who try to affect change. Loose cannons don't have a target. They just go off and, and fire at everyone and switch sides radically and, and, um, and just shout and scream everything that comes to mind. I think more than anything that in terms of conservative politics, what we have done is shown people that we are absolutely trustworthy, not towards to people. You know, we're not, we, don't, we don't swear allegiances to a group or person, you know, we, we swear allegiances to a cause and to that cause, we won't divert. And that's, you know, when I've spoken to lots of people on the right, that's what they've seen is that, you know, you can trust these people because they're going to take action when illegal stuff has been done, when the leadership diverts from the right course. And that's what people want. They don't want sheep, well, you know, some do want sheep, but um, in terms of leadership and, and managers and people pushing the movement, they don't want sheep. They want people who can think for themselves and who can push the cause and won't compromise just because some 70-year-old is going to threaten to terminate their membership. Yeah, look, I certainly think that um, the evidence is to the contrary. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sam Rat, but personally, I've certainly seen more doors opening up now at a much rapid more rapid pace than they were before and they're not destructive doors either they're constructive ones they're they're real fights rather than party infighting and if that I, I i'd like to think that that's an indication that people like the work that's you know been happening elsewhere and they like someone that's going to say what they mean and mean what they say and actually speak out on these issues because i, I think it's it's become unfortunately a rare thing and um I don't want to go into it, but just briefly, I've had a guy reach out to me at um, UTS and he's the university, and you guys are the first to hear this, the university isn't letting him graduate because he didn't complete this mandatory sexual consent test. Now, that was, that was a fight I started, but it will be a fight I help finish because they, these are issues that need to be fought and uh, no one else is fighting them. Well, I was glad that I could finally sit down with the, the pair of you and, and go through this whole uh, political story and unpack it every step of the way. And as you've both said at the end there, you're certainly not deterred from a future political activism. And now that things have calmed down, I hope that I can uh, have you back on the show, maybe in the future to be a regular contributor. Yeah. That'd be a pleasure. But thanks very much, Tim. And that's the show for today. As I've previously stated, Wave's episode will now focus on single topics rather than cramming all the current news into one show. But don't worry, we will still cover all the big issues that matter right now. Don't forget to also check out the latest episode of Debt Nation, hosted by uh, my colleague Steel Archer. Episodes are available on the Unshackled's YouTube channel, and there is also the new uh, dedicated Debt Nation YouTube channel where the episodes are slowly being uploaded to. We have also just broadcast a new episode of The Uncuckables, our joint production with XYZ and The Rational Rise, which is live every Thursday night at around 8.30pm Melbourne time on its own dedicated YouTube channel, so make sure you subscribe to that to be notified uh, when we go live. Remember that to counter the fake news and algorithmic manipulations, uh, we've just seen Project Veritas uh, release more uh, damning information about uh, Google. So for your search needs, use duck.go.com and Info Galactic for your information needs as an alternative to Wikipedia. There is also free speech social media, which The Unshackled has a presence on. We're on gab.com slash The Unshackled. We are also on minds.com slash The underscore Unshackled. And we are on mewe.com slash P slash The Unshackled. We also have our growing Telegram channel on the encrypted messaging service at t.me slash The Unshackled. 
Remember that the best method of supporting our work here at The Unshackled and so that we continue to grow and reach as many people as possible is to support us financially. You can do so at patreon.com slash the unshackled or at paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash membership and our web donation form at theunshackled.net slash donate. We are also on subscribestar.com slash the unshackled and we also have our online store with our popular merchandise, theunshackled.net slash store. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.